James chapter number 2, and uh, we spent this evening earlier looking at the audio, so hopefully we've kind of figured out the audio issue, and uh, hopefully, so if not, we'll work on it some more later in the week. But uh, we've been looking at uh, understanding Israel and Israel's program, and we've been looking through at the subject of justification and salvation, and we spent some time three or four lessons uh, looking at the issue of the different meanings of those two words, really when it pertains to uh, Israel. When you read the word just or justified or justification, uh, usually we think about being justified unto eternal life and the issue of our eternal security. Uh, Salvation, when we talk about that, usually we're talking about saved from the death and penalty of sin. But you can't do that all the time when you, when you begin to talk about, and, and especially in Israel's program, because justification, salvation, uh, even Paul, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, that word salvation there has got a context. And the context is being terrified by the adversaries and improper thinking and so forth. So context becomes the, the, the mantra, really. What is the context? We, and we begin to look at that. I gave you 10 or 12 different ways of, justific- of salvation could be used. Another eight or nine ways justification can be used. And, and that's important because usually what happens when we come to passages that we've, and we looked last time at Matthew uh, 24 there where he talks about it, those that endure to the end shall be saved. Well, that has a context of the issue of the day of the Lord and the issue of wrath and going into the tribulation. And then we looked over in Luke 23, and then we went and looked in Luke 18. And tonight, we're going to kind of wrap this subject up by looking at James 2 and verse 14. And the, the word, James 2, 14, What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Then if you, this section gets used by grace people today improperly. And, in, and really it's, a, it's one of the most used passages that is used incorrectly. And it's used from a misunderstanding or from a not understanding Israel's program. And you'll know, notice that it's James chapter 2 and verse 14. So obviously it has a context that it's sitting in of a chapter and a half before it. And so we want to look at that. But when you come to Hebrews through Revelation, those epistles, they follow the, 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 the design of, chapter, of 2 Timothy 3.16, doctrine, reproof, and correction. Doctrine, reproof, and correction. And when they follow that design, then, okay, we've got that. So it's teaching and it's communicating some doctrine. But when you begin to get into the passages, there's some things in it that if you're not paying attention, you'll completely biff. (laughs) You'll completely mess up. So you need to start, and when you're going to look at James 2, by the way, James 2, this is the passage that Luther wanted to rip out of his Bible He had come to understand Romans 4, and the fact that Romans 4 says faith without works, the man is simply believing there, Romans 4 verse 5, and he couldn't reconcile the two, so he's like, well, we'll just rip James out because we know justification is by faith alone. And that is the case all through your Bible. No matter where you're at, Genesis to Revelation, the only answer that God will ever accept is the issue of faith. Okay, the content of that faith is then the information that's been presented to him. Noah, he was a righteous man. He had faith. Well, he didn't trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He trusted in what God said when he told him to go build an ark. You know, the old saying is that the, uh, uh, you know, don't worry, the, um, the novice built the ark and the experts built the Titanic. Okay, so, you know, that's what they say. <laughs> but w- So when you come to James chapter 2, uh, we're just going to look, kind of wrap this up this evening, 
Look at a look at James two. Look over Matthew five, and uh, look at some of the passages in Hebrews, and just kind of wrap this up. And then we'll next week we'll uh, I want to go back in and look at some of the history of Israel. There's five or six chapters that just give a big context, a quick boom, boom, boom. Here it is, and uh, so forth. Uh, James chapter one, James chapter two, verse fourteen is where we're going to go. But we need to look back at James one, because when we look in James chapter number one, obviously verse one, James one one, James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So obviously he's not talking to the church, the body of Christ. He's talking to the the twelve tribes. And he's going to begin to talk, uh, run down to verse 18, James 1, verse 18. He's talking to, really, the believing remnant. So the believing remnant has already established uh, the number one definition of being justified, which is unto eternal life. They've already uh, expressed their faith. But in Israel's program, their faith is working, and then they have some other things they got to get done over here because they're going into that physical, literal, visible, physical, earthly, Davidic kingdom. So there's some things that they literally, physically, and visibly have to do going into that. Notice verse 18. Of his own will, and uh, his there is the Father, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. So these, this is the, the little flock, the believing remnant. They're, they're no longer members of the apostate nation. They've sub, been separated out. And he begins to, verse 18, there's really two issues going on here. He begat us with the word of truth. These folks, they've been begotten by God. And again, we just studied John. What's John? Flip over to John chapter 1. Hold on to James. Because the guys that he's talking to in James are the guys that fit John 1 verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The people that he's dealing with in James 1, James 2, are the people who meet the match, that qualification, in John chapter number 1. So they're already had the impact of the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're already... Uh, justified unto eternal life. They're already doing, occupying. He tells them there in, in the Gospels, I'm going to leave while I'm gone, occupy. And when you, by the way, that, that parable they're going to occupy, he gives them, remember the talents, 10? They, he comes back. He says, okay, here's my 10. Now you, now you have authority over 10 cities, over 5 cities, and then over no cities. And that issue of rewards is pop is coming into the picture. Well, occupy, occupation, doing the job. They're out doing the commission. They're out doing what they've been trained to do. That's why we spent so much time going through John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, because that's him educating them, getting them ready. The Holy Spirit comes in Acts 2. Now you got the comfort, another comforter on board, going to teach them and train them. So James fits those people. Now what, what kind of messes this all up, if you will, <laughs> is the church, the body of Christ, and the dispensation of grace, the interruption. So when the interruption is, out, is now been removed, which will be by the rapture, now we have another Acts 2 event going to take place. And we'll talk more about that when we look at the Hebrew passages to get that believing remnant started. The 144,000, get everything rolling again where it was interrupted, which is in Acts 7. Now notice, if you will, back verse 18. Begatten, uh, uh, begat he us with the word of truth. I don't know if you still got John. If not, flip back there to John, to John 6. 
and verse 47. John 6, 47. He begat in us, uh, he, he, uh, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. These guys are already justified. They already have eternal life. Okay? Now, when you look at James 1.18, they have an opportunity to do something now. Notice in the second part. The first part of 1.18, they have eternal life. They're, it's already secure. That issue is settled. So no matter what gets said in, in chapter 2 of James, isn't impacting that. But now look at the rest of verse 18. That. Now the purpose and the reason, the in, that word that, intent. Why did he begat us by with the word of truth? That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And that issue there of the first fruits. They are going to have a privilege as his creation. Well, what was Israel created to do? Sanctified. <laughs> They're set apart to do something, aren't they? But they have an opportunity. They have a privilege. By the way, you and I have the same privilege in today. Uh, we're in Titus 2 in Sunday school. We're looking at verse 11, 12, and 13. We're going to finish verse 13, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. We have the privilege to live that way right now in the present world. We have that, that, that is a privilege. We, we share in that. They have a privilege as his creation before the kingdom is established, by the way. Okay? To conduct themselves as a kind of the first fruits of his creation. They, so we're talking here about that wonderful word that gets kicked around and talking about discipleship. We're talking in the last days. We're talking about these guys ha have an opportunity to conduct themselves in line with who they are in the plan and the purpose that God has for the nation of Israel. And they have a privilege to live that way. To live that way at the moment have an impact to his honor and to his glory in the future. Because <laughs> the kingdom hasn't come yet here in James 2. He's getting them ready to go in through the 70th week of Daniel. And that issue, this issue here about the kind of first fruits, and that, that issue gets established back in Matthew chapter 5. So flip back there on the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount here, you, you, you get that, the beginning 12 verses about the Beatitudes. And, and really, the Beatitudes are, here's what the lifestyle of a kingdom saint is going to look like. Here's, they're going to be living spontaneously for the other people, not for themselves. Here's what life is going to look like. So then you start in verse 13. So Matthew 5.13, ye are the salt of the earth. That's who Israel really is. They're the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? We, <laughs> we went on our trip, and we took some little Pringles with us. And usually the originals are kind of salty, and they're good. These weren't. Popped them, they, they tasted stale. You know, they weren't because the, the seal popped, you know, you know, but they weren't salty. So we ate the other, the, the cheese and the sour cream. <laughs> you know, fed the birds the other ones. But see, the thing is, is it, it, it's, it's not doing its job. It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the feet of men. So if Israel isn't doing her job as a salt of the earth, there's, they should be trodden down. Verse 14, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Again, who, who are they to be? They're to be the city on the hill, a light. They're, gonna, they're, to, be, they're to shine. Neither do men 
light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Notice, they're going to be a light and they're going to shine so that people can do what? See their good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The, the world, the believing remnant is out there shining and doing what the salt of the earth is supposed to be doing. They're, they're doing their program so that who gets the glory and the honor? The Father does. By the way, not the devil. Not, so the issue here is, again, this issue of discipleship. And they are to live as who they are in Christ in Israel. And he's going to bring Abraham up here in James 1 and James 2 as that example there. They have good works to do, but so do you and I. Ephesians 2.10, where his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, unto good works that we should do that. So there are good works. There are good works. It, why do we do good work? Godliness is profitable, has a promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. We have benefit now in time, practicing who we are in Christ. They're the same way. They already know this, by the way, before James 1. They have already understand this. They, they've been dealing with this, this issue of conducting themselves as, who, as the true Israel of God, doing what the salt of the earth, the light of the world would do. They've got the truth, they've got the information, and they're doing. And it's going to make an impact. It's designed to make an impact. And they're going to do, we looked last week, or two weeks ago, I should say, the last lesson at that issue in Deuteronomy 4, when the world looks at Israel and they see that nation with God as its head, and they say, hey, man, how great a nation that is. They're doing that. It takes an impact. So when we come, hold on to Matthew 5, when you come there to James 1, verse 18, they're, they're doing that issue. So in James, the issue is about discipleship. It's about it's about being that kind of first fruits of his creatures. It's about going that direction. It is not about being justified unto eternal life. Now, in Matthew 5, we kind of continue here. Because then he says, verse 17. Again, they're not only concerned with that issue of justification unto eternal life, but they are also are to be concerned with the issue of discipleship. That's what James 1.18 is telling us. That, hey, he begat us by the word, that born-again terminology, so that we can go out here and be who we're supposed to be. And we can do that. Matthew 5, verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And that's an interesting thing there. there. There's this issue that's going on here about, hey, least and great getting in the kingdom, and so forth. But if you'll notice in verse 18, uh, for heaven and earth, till heaven and earth pass away, when, till all be fulfilled. He's, talk, he's reaching back into Deuteronomy 32. He's reaching back into Psalms 15, Psalms 24, Isaiah 33. And he's like, when all that comes to fulfillment, this is what's going to now be on board. So, let's run back there to Deuteronomy 32. Because he's not talking about in the mo he's not he he's talking about a very specific time. Deuteronomy 32, you have the song of Moses. And you have 52 verses. 
in this psalm. And could you imagine singing that on Sunday? All 52, let's go, you know, woo, you know. But it's an interesting read. When you begin to read verse 1, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain. And he begins to extol them. And he begins to talk to Moses. And he's got them going down there uh, through, really, some history. Okay? And he's got verse, thir- verse 18, Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Well, th- that rock, that's Christ. They've, what have they left? They've left the, the doctrine that dropped down as rain. Verse 32, For their vine is a vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asp. Look at verse 36. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted? Which did eat the fat of their sacrifice and drank the wine of their drink offerings? Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. All of that is a, is a, foretell, is a prophetic look at the 70th week of Daniel. When he takes Israel and puts her under the rod of the, of the Antichrist. Where he says, hey, you guys, you guys think he, the, the, the adversary, the enemy, he's your guy. And he, you just go to him. Let him take care of you. And he doesn't do that. Look down at verse 43. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people. For he shall avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and be merciful unto his land and to his people. There's the second coming. What is he doing here? Look over with me at Psalms 15. Psalms chapter 15. So when the Lord is in the Sermon on the Mount, and he's making, hey, until heaven and earth pass, well, when does heaven and earth pass? Out there after the second coming, after the great white throne judgment, and he's making a, a jump back, if you will, because he's talking about n- none of the law. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Psalms 15. Here in Psalms 15, in five verses, is the outline for the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through Matthew 7. <laughs> Here it is. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is uh, contemned, But he honoreth them that fear the Lord, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not, he that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. Verse 2 is a verse, by the way, that gets abused as well. Because what does it say? He that walketh uprightly and worketh what? So they take that righteousness and they stick it over there on eternal life and so forth, And that's nothing in this passage is talking about justification unto eternal life. He's talking about them that they have the opportunity to go live as who they live in Christ. Do you see that? It's a fascinating thing. Come over to Psalms 24. So you you know you take Psalms 15 like that, and and by the way, you, you have to read all the whole of the Sermon on the Mount, and you know what you begin to see? You begin to see in the Sermon on the Mount. They're going to put their money out to usury. That believing remnant's going to look around and they're going to see other, other, the unbelieving Jew prospering while they're taking it in the neck. And they're going to sit there and go, what, why, why the delay, Lord? Nail that dude. <laughs> and he goes, it's not time yet, and I'll get him when it's time. 
How long, O oh Lord? Exactly. Uh, look at Psalms 24. By the way, Psalms 15 is a psalm of David. Psalms 24, a psalm of David. Uh, chapter 24 of Psalms, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's, and all the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. For he, shall, he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Wow, look at those. Who's, who, who's going to do that? He that hath clean hands and a, what kind of heart? Pure heart. You know, in James we read about the pure religion, and it's a pure heart. Taking care of the fatherless and the widows and, do, and keeping their garments not, uh, spotless. That's all referenced, by the way, in James to the overcomer group that's coming. The context sits in the second coming, the uh, 70th week of Daniel, all that out there. Look down at verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Verse 10, who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Selah. By the way, every time you see that word, Selah, um, I know what the, the commentaries all like that pregnant pause because they think about poetry and music, but Selah helps you, hey, we're talking about second coming, we're talking about the day of vengeance, we're talking about a future event there. What's, well, when does the king of glory come in? <laughs> Out there when the kingdom is, is established. Come over to Isaiah 33. I saved this one for last because it asks a very poignant question. Isaiah 33, again, verse 1, Woe to thee that spoilest, and thou wast not spoiled, and dealest treacherously, Isaiah 33, verse 1, and they dealt not treacherously with thee. When thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled. And when thou shalt make an end to, the deal, to deal treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with thee. It says a messed up situation. <laughs> Verse number 6. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. We looked at this when we were talking about the different salvations. This is over in the day of the Lord. Verse 11, ye shall conceive chaff, ye shall bring forth stubble, your breath as fire shall devour you. And now, man, just those terms of, of judgment of him burning the chaff on the, on the floor. Verse 14, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Boy, what a, two great questions. Notice the answer in verse 15. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly. He that despise the gain of oppressors, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes. There's that money out to usury stuff we were talking about earlier. You see, we've moved over into that 70th week of Daniel. Isaiah 33, look at verse 17. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. Verse 22, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. So when you come back to Matthew 5, where are we at? He's given the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about a future day. He's teaching them, getting them ready, the believing remnant. Back in Matthew 5, by the way, if you look at verse 1, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. He's not talking to the big group. He's talking to that believing remnant, specifically the leadership of that believing remnant. And he's talking about a future day. Verse 20. Matthew 5, verse 20, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You see, they got some stuff to take care of. So when you come over to James 1, 
Just flip back there. We got to get moving here. We'll. There's so much to this. Literally, you could just spend a lifetime trying to figure it out and trying to put it where it belongs. And there are men that do, have done that. And I'm just trying to get you to understand when you jump into a passage and you want to use it on someone, at least know what you're talking about. Because if you're going to do what, John, what we're going to see here in James 2, talk about James 2, it's got a context of chapter 1, verse 18, where he's not talking about justification unto eternal life. He's talking about they have an opportunity to live as God has equipped them to live in the present time, in the moment. And, and again, it's James that would make the same statement in chapter 4, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanish away. That's 4.14, verse 13. He says, go to now ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there year and buy and sell and get gain. Yeah. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. He's not talking about in, in the day. He's talking about a future event yet coming, future of us today. So when you come to 2.14 and it says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? The, well, the answer to the question is yes. <laughs> but that's not what he's talking about. Now, 2.14 has got a few verses in front of it. So run back up to verse 12. Because the stuff between verse chapter 1, verse 18 and 2.14 He's equipping them, he, he's, he's got them there, he's blessed them. And then in 2.12 he says, So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. And that's an interesting thing there. So you're going to speak the word, you're going to do, you got that pure religion there in chapter 1, verse 27, you, you got all this stuff going on. You're going to lay a what? You're going to live a life that is separate from everybody else, and then and it's the law of liberty. So he says, verse thirteen: For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. Now, if you want to understand the reality of the mercy rejoicing against judgment, and you want to understand judgment without mercy, you're going to get all of that. Then, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say? And again, notice the, the issue of the word say. They're not talking about justification unto eternal life. Now we're saying something. Verse 16. And one of you say, verse 18, Yea, a man may say. It's an interesting thing there. These guys are, when you say something, you're doing something. Okay, it's an activity. But notice, we're sitting in the context of the second, the 70th week of Daniel. The kingdom is coming. And he comes up here now and he says, look guys, what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man may say, um, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Hang on here, let me see. Somebody's telling me. Okay. Sorry. I, with the audio mess, we're trying to make sure it's working and so forth. He's now going to reach in and he's going to grab Abraham. And he's going to use Abraham. Because every Jew out there knows who Abraham is. All right? Now, look down at verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Well, was Abraham our father justified by works when he did that? Yes, he was. But he wasn't justified unto eternal life. Because that happened in Genesis 15, verse 6. Right? The answer is yes. Genesis 22 is when he offered up Isaac, verse 21. 
his son upon the altar. That's 40 years later. So, justification unto eternal life with Abraham was established in Genesis 15 when he simply believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, 40 years later, what is he going to do? Well, he's going to be justified. By the way, justified, declared to be what? Right, just, doing what's right. But notice verse 23. Well, verse 22, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? It's an interesting concept there. Verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. There's Genesis 15, verse 6. And he was called the what? The friend of God. There's Genesis 22. His friendship, his, so here in James 2, you've got really both unto eternal life and the working and doing there. But in that second one where he was, verse 21, let me say it like this. In Genesis 15, he's declared righteous. That, that's what verse 23, okay? Believe God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. All right? And he was called the friend of God. There's the second component. When you call someone a friend, it means you have a what with them? A relationship. So the issue here is that there is a relationship that Abraham had with God after his justification unto eternal life. They are going to have the same thing. They are going to have an opportunity to now go and have a relationship by living as who they are in, their program, in Christ in their program. Watch verse, go back up to verse 17. Even so, faith if it had not works, is dead being alone. Abraham had faith. It was counted to him for righteousness. He had complete obedience to God about the seed and the coming seed, and he was going to be given a seed and so forth. But now in verse 22 and 23, he's going to move and talk about this relationship. He's the friend of God. Deuteronomy 13 verse 6 defines a friend as someone who has the same heartbeat, the same heart. Well, what do the believing remnant get an opportunity to do here? To live in that heartbeat that they just learned from the Lord Jesus Christ in the earthly ministry part. He's now ascended, risen up. You've got the, the uh, the 12 in place, you've got the, the believing remnant there, and what can they do? He can come along now and call them a friend. So really, James 2 here, not, not, none of this justified before man. I, I heard that one time, I'm like, what? This has nothing to do about that. What are they doing? They believe God. They, they, John 6, 47, they got eternal life because they believed who he was. Because they believed who he was, he's got... A, they got something to go do. So they go over here and they do it. And when they do it, they bring honor. They, they do that kind of first fruits of his creature. They bring honor and glory to the Father. They get that opportunity to do it right in the moment. In the moment of the 70th week of Daniel. In the moment of the tribulation. In the moment of his second coming. In the moment of going into the kingdom. They get the opportunity to be perfected. Now, run back to John 8. Just Again, we just got finished studying John, so John gets to be on the brain a little bit here. John chapter 8. D do you follow that? So James 2, I know what it says, and I know all the denominations run to it, but you and I, we need to back up and say, hang on a minute. <laughs> There's a, another issue going on, and that's that issue of their walk in time and who they are in Christ. 
Okay. Now we didn't deal with. I'm not, I wasn't trying to deal with all the doctrine that's going on in James two. I just wanted you to see. Don't knee jerk to the issue of justification unto eternal life. There, there's something else going on in Israel's program. Notice John eight. Notice verse thirty nine. Just quickly here. They answered and said, uh, verse thirty eight. I speak that which I have seen with my father. And ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. You see, they they understood who Abraham was. Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. Isn't that interesting how he says that? They would do the works, not just say they're going to do it, but they would do what? They would do it. And what would they do? Verse 40, But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. You see, Abraham didn't try to kill God. Abraham did what? Believed God. Then said they, verse 41, to him, We be not born of fornication. I always got to get that dig in there with Mary. We have one Father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your Father, the devil. Nailed them. Then he comes over. In verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. (laughs) That's that thing in Hebrews 11 where they seeing afar. (laughs) They didn't receive the promise, but they knew it was coming, and they died believing in what? The promise is coming. Then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet fifty years old, and thou hast seen Abraham. Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was... I am. Ooh, nailed him again. So when you think about James 1, come back over to 1 Peter chapter 2. James 2, again, Abraham had two different kinds of justifications, if you will. One unto eternal life, Genesis 15, and then one over here to be in that relationship with God and an intimate relationship with God as a friend of God. 1 Peter 2, verse number 11, Peter picks up on this, and he says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may be your good work, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. The day of visitation, when the Gentiles are held accountable, they're going to be able to look over there and they have seen that believing room. That goes to that issue in Matthew 25 when he says, when he separates the nations and he puts the goats on the, right, and the sheep on the right hand. And they say, Lord, when did we do this to you? And he says, when you did it unto the least of, me, of my brethren. When did we visit you? When did we? And then the other side didn't, and they just go off into hell. <laughs> it's like, how did that happen? Well, because there they are. Because that believing remnant, they are the friend of God. And again, you've got to understand Israel's program there. And you've got to understand that that believing remnant is under the gun. Now, quickly, run over to Hebrews. Here, here's another passage. I'll give you a couple more passages. So, by the way, James 2, read it, study it, learn, love it, but leave it in Israel's program. <laughs> okay? And if someone brings it up to you, just sit there and say, read one ver- uh, James 1.1. 1, 1. Who's he talking to? Boom, we'll just leave it right there and move on, <laughs> if they'll let you. Usually, if they won't, they're picking a fight. They're looking for something to fight you with, and you can move on. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, notice, if you will, uh, verse number 6. Here's another verse that they like to use 
uh, to say the issue of justified unto eternal life. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And again, there's the, the issue of the work of endurance and you know, the confidence and the hope un, unto the end and so forth. And <clears throat> nowhere in that verse is it talking about the issue of eternal life. Uh, by the way, this gets a play because people think that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and when you understand that he doesn't, he didn't write it, then it kind of, Hebrews, who are the Hebrews? They're Hebrews. <laughs> okay. Who wrote the book? God at sundry times. He wrote the book. There, obviously, he had a human author. We don't know who that is, but God wrote the book. So, but anyway, verse 6 there, it, it's, the, the issue in this is about being a part of Christ's house. That's what the issue is, see? But Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house are we? See, the issue there is being in the house. By the way, if you drop down to verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. See, that's an issue of not the issue of eternal life, but it's the issue of being a part of the royal house. And again, you got to understand what's happening here. By the way, just because you're in the royal family doesn't mean you live in the royal house. You know, you see the queen over there and you see, you know, the, the boys married and they got their families going and all of a sudden you hear about some princess, Eugene or something. I was like, who? You know, I don't know if it's Eugene or not. I just made, oh, Eugenia. See, I made it up. I, anyway, you hear him, it's like, who did, where did that one, well, she's a long distance cut, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, huh? But she's what? She's part of the royal family, the line, but she never makes the big house unless it's a big party. All those of Israel are not Israel. Just because you can show the descendancy, if you don't have the faith, this, your sins issues covered doesn't mean you're going to get into the house. So the issue here in 3.6 has to do with the house. What is Israel? Well, the, <laughs> it's the house. By the way, when you think about the house, we call Congress the House of Representatives. What are, they're the authority, aren't they? They're the leaders, supposed to be. Okay? So a house is a governing body. Who's the governing body of the kingdom? That believing remnant is. See? Okay? So we're not talking about, you know, hey, you could lose it. You never had it, so you can lose No, these guys had it. They just got to get the program down till the end. They're, they're already taken care of. Come over to chapter 6. Here's another passage. This one, man, this one... Gets people all, all wonkers. Chapter 6, verse 4. For it, is, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. And I wish we had a, two hours to look through all these verses because, it, again, it's a very misunderstood passage. The believer falling away, right? These guys aren't believers. You see, they... they <coughs> <laughs> they're doing things that, well, we looked at that passage, I'll remind you, in 1 John chapter 2, in verse 18, 19, and 20, where he says, They were of us, but they were not real. They, uh, um, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out. What did they do? They, they left. They fell away. 1 John 2, verse 
18, I'm in verse 19, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Verse 18 starts out with that little children, that believing remnant title. Here they are. You see, they crucified. By the way, back in Hebrews 6, verse 6, who crucified the Lord the first time? They did. Okay. Now they're doing it again. That isn't an issue of belief and faith. That's an issue of unbelief. They didn't believe that he was the Messiah to begin with. They just thought he was a usurper. And they got Rome to get in there. You see, Hebrews 6, we're in the day of the Lord. We're in the 70th week of Daniel time period. We're in the future again, just where we were in James. They're going to respond the same way. Now, you've got to think about something here. You've got the nation of Israel going along, Acts 7, the stoning of Stephen. Okay? What was to be poured out the next moment? The wrath of God. It was coming. The timeline. It's interrupted, right? At the moment that it's interrupted, what happened here with, the he with Hebrews through Revelation? It's all put on hold. The rapture takes place. We go home. It's going to literally pick right up where he left off in Acts 7 and 8. So there's, they're going to have a... So when he says that it was impossible, you were once enlightened, you've tasted the gifts, they're going to have another Acts 2 event all over again. And then actually, that's not out of the norm, because in Acts 2, you have the Holy Ghost poured out. Acts 3, you do it. Acts 5, they do it. And Acts 6, they do it. So the pouring out of the Holy Ghost isn't anything new in that period. Hebrews are going to do the same thing. They're going to, but what are they going to do? They're going to respond the same way that they originally did. When Peter and the boys go out there to the council, the council says, Dude, you can do, guys, you can do whatever you want to do. Just don't bring up the name Jesus of Nazareth. You can go do whatever you want. What are, what are these guys doing? Money and gold I don't have, but man, I got Jesus, and here he is, and he's the Messiah, and he's going to be coming back here in a few years. And they're like, oh, and they're offended. There's a whole program going on here. They're not talking about being justified unto eternal life. They've rejected all of that to begin with. Rather, they're looking at the issue here, and, and, and he's looking at that issue of what's coming. And what you really are beginning to see, come over to Hebrews chapter 12 is that that believing remnant is beginning to leave the apostate nation just to itself and come out of it. They're just completely done with it. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 12, in verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. There it is again. Seeing the Lord there isn't the issue of believing unto eternal life. Seeing the Lord has to do with that issue of Matthew 5, Isaiah 33, that day of judgment of Him coming back, setting up the kingdom, and then they move in. Okay? The key here in all of this is Israel's got a big program that they're a part of. It's laid out. Now they're out there doing it. You go to Revelation 2. And, you, and three, I mentioned these last week, about the overcomer. L look at Revelation 2. Just, it's, it's just fascinating. Revelation 2, verse 1, Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Okay. Now, when he, when he gives these seven messages to the seven angels, they are pictures of all of the churches, not just the one church. There's way more than seven churches in the region. <laughs> okay, They're scattered abroad. They're, they're pockets all over the place. Actually, second, in Peter, when he writes 1 Peter, he's in Babylon. He says hello from Babylon. And, you know, here is... But watch verse 2. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, 
And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. They're out there doing. They're out there under attack. <coughs> and he says, verse 5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But that, this thou hast, and, thou, and that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit saith unto the church is, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And he does that all through the seven, the overcomer, the overcomer. But what is the overcomer doing? Who is the overcomer? It's the believing remnant. They're out there doing. They're out there paying attention. They're out there running what they're hearing through the seven test of 1 John. They're out there paying attention. They'll stumble, but that's okay. He are, they already know they have an advocate with the Father. They have a propitiation there, 1 John 2, 1 John 1. They got all that. They're not worried about not getting eternal life. They're just worried about maintaining the things on their, ta on their plate <laughs> that they have to do. But people use these passages to say, see, you've got to have faith and works or else you're not in. And that's just not the case. One more passage. We're going to go back to the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 15. In all of this, as we kind of wrap this section of the study of, of understanding Israel up and move on, move on next week on, into some of the history, 1 Samuel 15 verse 22 is a passage that you just kind of need to put in the back of your mind. That the, in the Old Testament... In the nation of Israel, faith and faith alone is always the issue. Okay? The fact is that justification unto eternal life or sanct salvation from the debt and penalty of sin is by grace through faith without works. It's always faith alone. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord... As great, I'm sorry, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Which one is, brings greater delight to the Lord? The sacrifices and the offerings or obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of the rams. Faith is is not defined, Hebrews 11 verse 1 does not define faith. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says this is what faith looks like. Faith is a positive response to the Word of God to you. Faith rests when you just simply come up and you say, hey, here's what God's Word said to me. I believe it, I trust it, and off we go. Noah, the word to Noah from the Lord was build the ark. We've got things coming, judgment's coming. Enoch is over there. He's got the ungodly going. He's got all that faith to Abraham was, I'm going to give you a seed. That's why Galatians 3, when he says the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, what did he preach to Abraham? The gospel he preached to Abraham. What was the gospel? In your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. <laughs> Nothing about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ was preached by Peter and the guys as a negative event. Paul turns and says, hang on, progressive revelation says it's a positive event for all mankind. Two different, same event, two different outlooks to it. Faith in the Old Testament is the issue. Obeying the Word of God. Trusting God. The Word of God. So we just need to be careful when we begin to pull verses out and use it on people. The one, they probably know less than you do, and you don't know all of it either. <laughs> 
Okay, so it's best just to understand that when people use those verses, one, they're using it for an attack. But two, they're, you're, they're using it to bring in confusion, and you don't need to do that. You need to be clear. Okay? So that ends our little study of justification and salvation, if you will. There's so much more to have been said, but just for time and wanting to do some other things, we didn't do that. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord, for the evening, Lord. We thank you for the day, for the study, for those that are here, for the interest in it. And we just give you the praise and the honor and the glory for that. In your name we pray. Amen.